Yeah, good evening. Uh, so welcome to Lancaster University for this public lecture on teaching, tweeting and trolling our online worlds. That's a good tongue twister for me. Um, I'm Steve Deeson. I'm Provost Chancellor for Research at, at Lancaster University. Um, so tonight is a series of, um, it's part of the series of public lectures we have at Lancaster, some of which we have here on our campus, some of which we have in the, in the centre of, um, of Lancaster, and occasionally we have them, have them elsewhere, in, including, including in London, and very, very pleased, very pleased to see people here, here this evening on, on our campus. Um, so I'm very pleased to be joined tonight by four of our leading academics in, in linguistics, Professor Judith Cormus, Dr. Karen Tusting, Dr. Julia Gillen, and Dr. Claire Hardacre. So they're from the Department of Linguistics and English Language at Lancaster University. Um, this is a department at Lancaster we're very proud of. It recently won the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Higher Education, and our Vice-Chancellor and colleagues from linguistics um, were down at Buckingham Palace a couple of weeks ago picking up um, this prize, um, this, uh, and linguistics is ranked about tenth in, in the world. So this is this is one of our our premier departments at the university, and we're absolutely delighted to have some of our leading academics here um, uh, uh, tonight to give to give this lecture. Um, tonight's topic is especially um, pertinent as the 21st of March will mark the tenth anniversary of the first tweet that was sent. It's estimated now that there's in excess of 500 million tweets are sent every day, and Facebook has recently achieved 800 million monthly users, to, just to give the scale of, 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 of the amount of activity that's going on. Our speakers tonight are going to approach the subject of online identities from four different perspectives. Uh, Professor Judith Cormus um, will start off with an insight into how thousands of people can find learning in an online course as rewarding as, as in a classroom and, and, and to talk about some of the challenges that that gives for university lecturers. Um, then Karen will explore um, how people respond to the demand to develop a professional identity um, online. Julia will examine how we use humour in, on, in our online interactions and particularly talking about cricket on Twitter. And finally, Claire will talk about some of the darker sides of, um, of, 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 um, of, of the online world and, and particularly around online, online abuse. When we've heard from all of our speakers, we'll open out to questions from the audience. Um, tonight's event is being filmed. Um, if you prefer not to appear on film, then could you let one of the staff uh, uh, um, uh, here, here this evening here this evening know? Um, we're not planning to have any fire drills. If, if, uh, if a fire alarm does go off, then, then the building really is on fire. Um, there's the fire exit, and we will we, we, we walk out in a very orderly and, and sensible way. Um, but so thank you very much for coming coming this evening, and I'll pass you on to our first speaker, Judith. Thank you very much. So, how do we teach in the modern online world in the 21st century and what are the challenging challenges that we face as university lecturers and teachers? You will be surprised, but my answer will be, we don't teach anymore. We create the right circumstances for students to learn. We don't teach, we mentor our students, we tutor them, we facilitate their learning. And this is what I will be talking about today in the context of a massive open online learning course. Now, when I talk about a massive open online, corning, uh, online um, learning course, then how many people do you think I taught in the MOOC, that, in this massive open online learning course that I delivered last April? Who thinks there were 5,000 learners? Who thinks there were 10,000? Who thinks there were 15,000? Who thinks there were 18,000? Okay. It was 18,000 learners. Okay. So what do you do with 18,000 learners um, in an online environment? That's more than the students we have at Lancaster University. Um, and one of the answers that I will give is that you plan your course really well. You have a very clear outline and design of your course. You also need to know what your students want to know. You've, you, you do research on your audience and who your students will be. And finally, you mentor them well, you train the mentors, and you look after them so that they can actually learn in that environment. 
So what are these massive open online learning courses? Just in a few words, they take place entirely online. They, uh, they are free to enroll for almost for everybody. Some courses require some previous knowledge, some don't. They usually take between three to eight weeks, and uh, they usually require about two to four hours of learning. My course was about dyslexia and language teaching. And so how did I try to make it successful, and what were the challenges? So planning an online course is like planning a city. You have to know who, your, who the inhabitants of your city will be. You need to make sure that the students feel comfortable and they, they find their way around easily and that they have also interesting things to do. But the first thing is, who will be your learners? I was quite lucky because we had an European Union funded project where we surveyed teachers uh, about what they wanted to find out about dyslexia and language learning, and I could use that knowledge. For some courses, this is not possible, and then you have to kind of use your imagination and try to rely on your professional judgment what your students will need. Once you have an idea, and a clear plan of what your students might want to learn about, you start planning the course. There are some key features because the students will be learning on their own. One of these is that the course should be very, very logically organized. You move from simple to complex. You take very logical st steps. You make sure that there, is, there are opportunities for revision and recycling what the students have learned. And of course, you make sure that all the instructions are crystal clear because you don't want the 18,000 students coming back and asking questions because you can't obviously deal with those. Another important feature of online course design is ensuring that it's, uh, it has variation, it is interesting, and it engages the students. Again, if I go back to my city metaphor, you don't want all your houses in the city to look the same. And many online courses fail if they just use a very narrow variety of tasks and if they say, here is a video, watch it, or here is an article, read it. What I have done in my course was I had a variety of videos, for example, with dyslexic language learners where they talked about their own experiences. We had classroom demonstrations of tasks. We had interviews uh, with, um, with teachers who, who teach dyslexic uh, students and interviews with experts as well. And I didn't simply tell the students, here is a video, watch it. But I prepared the students before they watched the video. I asked them questions to think about, um, to reflect on their existing practices in teaching. And I also prepared some worksheets for the students to work on while they were watching the video that helped them to take notes and remember the key points. After they watched the video, I again posed them some questions to reflect on what they learned and how they could apply it. And again, that ensured that they engaged with the materials themselves. In other words, I wanted the students to look behind the facades of those houses and open doors and, and look around. And even though the courses are designed so that the students can learn on their own and, in, and autonomously, it is very important that you build in some kind of interaction among the learners in the course. And I also made sure that students had forums where they could share their ideas. And it was also very important that the kinds of questions you ask in these forums would actually prompt the participants to answer those questions. And I found that if the questions were very specific and focused, students would engage with them. So again, you have to pay attention to the kind of question that you are asking. And finally, the mentoring element of the course. We had um, a very intensive mentoring arrangement, and that is challenging because it, re it requires resources from the university and the resources from the lead educator as well. The, um, the mentors help the students when they were lost, okay? They have them back and to find the lost trail. Uh, we, um, we also help the students when we picked up some misunderstandings and we were trying to pay attention to that. Uh, 
what we also did was to encourage the students to interact with each other. So if we spotted that there was a good discussion going on, the mentor was trying to encourage that discussion to take it further and, and, and bring in other ideas. We also tried to create a learning community. For example, when the students entered, for they first posted something on the platform, we were trying to respond and say hi or just welcome them to make sure that they feel part of that learning community. And it was very successful, and the students actually also started mentoring each other and helping each other. When the students had questions, the mentors didn't come in immediately. We waited a little bit to try to see if there is someone else trying to help that question, because it's much more effective in terms of learning in that um, environment. We had a mentor for each day of the course for eight hours uh, of the day, so it was very intensive, and I, as a lead educator, was also on standby for at least one or two hours a day trying to answer anything that came up from the mentors. So, how successful can such a course be? From our perspective as mentors and lead educators, I can say that it was one of the best teaching experiences of my life. It was very rewarding because we could take education to people who would otherwise not have had access to this kind of education and knowledge. We had participants, for example, from the middle of Australia, from a very remote Scottish island, from different parts of India, Myanmar, Argentina, and, and, and you name it. We also did a very brief research on how the students benefited from the course and we, what we found that the teachers believe that they can teach dyslexic learners more successfully after completing the course changed. Um, we did a survey before and after the course and we found significant changes in, in teachers' beliefs about what they can do. Um, but overall, in an online course, you learn as much you put in, and that's something that we can't control. But if you create the right learning environment and facilitate students' learning, then these online courses can be very successful. Well, thank you, and I, I now pass on to Karen. Thanks, Judith. Um, Hi, I'm Karen Testing, and I'm going to be talking about um, professional identities and social media. Um, as Steve said, Twitter's been going 10 years, Facebook a bit longer than that, I think, and social media has transformed many aspects of our everyday lives, including our workplaces. I'm going to be talking about the academic workplace and, and the professional academic identity, but I will be interested to hear afterwards whether any of these um, things resonate with your own experiences in the workplace. So academics spend a lot of their time writing. What kinds of things do you think we write? We, we, might, we might write books, we write weighty tomes like this one, and journal articles in scientific journals, and lengthy PowerPoints of lectures that we give students. We do, of course, spend time writing all of these things. But we also spend a lot of time writing in other genres nowadays, and the genres in which we write have massively expanded. You've just heard Judith talk about the MOOC, and you can imagine the amount of different kinds of writing that were associated with that. But we also have our own personal web pages that we have to maintain and keep up to date. Um, people keep blogs where they publicize their research. Um, we tweet, and we retweet, and we read tweets. We contribute to other kinds of online social media, like the conversation, which is like a big academic, research-oriented blog. And even when we write public lectures, um, they go up on YouTube and get shared in social media in different ways. So there are lots of new kinds of things that we're doing, and how has this transformed what we're doing as academics? Um, I work as part of a big research project funded by the Economic and Social Research Council that looks at exactly that. What kinds of writing practices do academics engage in in their everyday working lives? We're working across three different universities, across three different disciplines, and we're talking to academics in depth, repeatedly, about their everyday writing practices and their histories of writing practices. Um, and social media has come up as one of the key themes that people have talked to us about. And the, the quotes I'm going to share with you are all coming from these interviews. So social media has a lot of advantages for academics. 
First of all, it allows us to share our research with a much wider range of audiences. And here we've got a quote from somebody who was a little dismissive about Twitter, but is considering going on to it because of the reach that you have through Twitter in engaging with new people. People use social media quite strategically. So when new publications come out, Social media provides a means of, of advertising them. When I have something published, it'll be all over Twitter, says an early career researcher. And a more established researcher said that he signed up to Facebook and Twitter explicitly to promote his, his book sales. We're also aware that university senior management like us to have strong social media profiles. And one of our participants said, well, I don't do much social media, but coming up to promotions committee, you do have to push it a bit. <laughs> um, there's an intrinsic value as well to, to social media engagement. So, for instance, people who keep blogs do often also are often very productive in terms of journal articles, and it's recognised that it provides a space for developing new ideas and developing writing. So there's lots of things that social media bring. But having said that, our participants also shared with us some of the challenges that engaging in social media as an academic have. The first one is that we're all under enormous amounts of time pressure, and every time you write something for social media, you're not writing on another kind of writing. And as the, the top quote says here, at the end of the day, you might have a fabulous blog, but what you're judged on is your papers, meaning your journal articles, your books, your scholarly outputs. Those are the things against which we're evaluated. And the second one says, well... A blog post, for me, that's a little bit like writing an article in the Times Higher. It takes the same amount of time. I'd actually rather write something for the Times Higher because I'm engaging with a specific audience then. So there's always choices to be made. There's always a cost-benefit to engaging in social media. Um, and yes, you do extend your reach to a wider audience, but you also find that you start to engage in different kinds of interaction with the audience and things get evaluated in new ways. You might have people engaging with your research who, as the first quote says, a lot of people might start commenting on what you're doing without actually understanding what you're doing, without having the background, judging it in new ways. And the second one, Twitter can make you feel persecuted, links into what Claire's going to be talking about later. Academics who are very active on social media are just as um, open to the dark side of Twitter as others. The timescales of social media are really different to the timescales academics are used to. We're used to, um, we're used to, as the bottom quote says, having the lifetime of your research counted in years, not weeks or months. But the first quote uses this lovely metaphor of social media being like a balloon. You pop it up, there's suddenly a ton of interest in your work for a short period of time, and then woof, a ping goes into it, onto the next thing. So you have to adapt to these different timescales. There was also a sense of discomfort, and I think this is really important. There's a discomfort about self-publicizing on social media. Um, the top quote here says, well, it's kind of, I, I don't like pushing my work on Twitter because it goes back to how I've been brought up. It's, it's, it's nicer if you don't say anything and people are pleasantly surprised at how well you've done. And the second one describes blogs and Twitter as quite self-indulgent, focused on minor things about the self, which is not the kind of thing that academics have traditionally been judged on. So there was a real discomfort there. The result of this is that academics engage in social media in, in very varied ways. Some, some of our participants are, are very involved with social media and, and blog and tweet, but others resist it. And where they resist it, they feel very strongly about it. So they say things like, I have an utter aversion to social media, utter and complete. That's one of my favorite quotes from the data. Um, and somebody absolutely refusing to involve themselves in social networking, happy to publicize their work online in other ways, but not social networking. I think part of what's going on here is that once you start to engage in social media, it promotes a focus on the person as well as the work in a way which those traditional academic genres that I started out with don't. So, and academics aren't always comfortable with this. There's a few celebrity academics. You've got your Brian Coxes and that kind of thing. But... Um, a lot of academics will say things like, I'd rather let my output speak for, them, speak for itself, speak for themselves. I'm an academic, that's all you need to know right now about me. You need to read my work. 
The question is how far this shift to much more engagement online, which is expected of us and which a lot of people are doing, is actually changing what it means to be an academic, changing the nature of the academic professional identity to become much more open, much more public facing and much more about the person as well as the research. This is what we're investigating further in, one of the things we're investigating further in our project. Thank you very much. And I'm introducing Julia Gillen, who'll talk about another aspect of online professional identity now. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to talk about Test Cricket, Twitter, and a radio programme called Test Match Special. This features the BBC cricket commentator, Jonathan Agnew. But don't be concerned if you don't know anything about Test Cricket, or if you know that you don't like it. I hope to show that it's an interesting setting for considering new communication channels such as Twitter and how people respond to them creatively. And what you need to know about Test Cricket is that it's a very traditional form of the game and it's been played between international teams for over 100 years. In 2006, the British Parliament decreed that the um, game of cric Test Cricket as squarely at the forefront of the nation's affections should be on terrestrial TV but like many battles, they lost to Sky TV. And so the BBC was left with radio and the programme Test Match Special, which had been broadcast since 1957. The problem here is that while it appeals to an increasingly older audience, there's a need to attract new people, including social media users. The BBC cricket correspondent Jonathan Agnew grasped the challenge. While keeping traditional users happy on the radio with Test Match Special's blend of witty and warm humour in the way it's always interacted with listeners, he also used new platforms, the new channels. Some of them you'll have heard of probably, like Internet Fora, Twitter, some you might not have done, like Periscope and so forth. He experimented with them, as well as doing all his traditional stuff, like talking on the radio, writing books and so forth. So for a period of three years, I sampled his communications across these different channels to come to an understanding of his work and the interaction with users and how they reacted. Today, I'm talking with you about just one day, 10th of August 2011. It's the first day of a test match in Birmingham. A test match can take place over up to five days. It's been calculated that, around, that therefore, for around 80% of the time, nothing's happening. So there's, and it, it, because obviously there's a huge amount of resting. So there's a huge opportunity there, a need even, on the radio, for example, to keep talking, keep communicating. I listened to the Test Match special, which was broadcast between 10.45 a.m. and 6.30 p.m., writing notes on many mentions of, all mentions of media and many other details that would help me in my analysis later. I collected all Jonathan Agnew's tweets and as many as I could of those directed at him or to which he responded to, those to which he retweeted, that is repeated to his extensive audience of followers. He tweeted from 7.15 a.m. to 8 p.m. It was quite a tiring day of research, unpredictably long. Um, and I want to give you just a flavour of the place of humour in these interactions. There's often a concern before a cricket match as to whether it will go ahead. In England, the possibility of rain is often a worry. But on this day, there was, a tradition, there was an additional concern. There had been riots the night before in Birmingham and other cities in the UK. In Birmingham alone, where the test match was situated, there had been 130 arrests the night before. So, around 7.15... A celebrity Sky weather forecaster, Lucy Verasami, had tweeted, Rain in Manchester, Liverpool today could hamper the clean-up effort. Brollies as well as brooms needed, riot clean-up. Some of you might remember media reports of people coming out onto the streets to clear up in the aftermath of the riots. Now, on the radio, uh, Jonathan Agnew wouldn't have um, mentioned Sky, let alone interacted, but on Twitter, things are freer. And as another celebrity tweeter... He tweeted deftly, very shortly, Edge Baston, bit brighter, revealing an expectation that he would get a reply. You'd obviously lose face if you addressed another celebrity with such a brief uh, tweet and didn't get a reply. And indeed he did. Lucy demonstrating her understanding that details of cloud cover and humidity are important to cricketers. Agnew and his audience did discuss the riots on Twitter. His first tweet about the aftermath of the riots was somewhat elliptical. 
For anyone concerned, I have spoken to ECB. Edgebaston test goes ahead as planned. Here he is displaying his authority and expertise. Not everyone can talk to the Eng England Cricket Board. I'm moving now from showing you something of what the Twitter data looked like as I co collected it to a more simplified presentation. So here are just two of the many, many tweets that responded to Agnew's Twitter announcement that the match would go ahead. You can see that these, as many others, are care carefully crafted at Aggers Cricket, looking fun, frivolity and fine cricket from Aggers & Co today. We all need cheering up from recent events. This uses alliteration and ties together the topic of cricket and riots. The second, at Aggers Cricket, they may smash our cars, burn our shops, break our windows. They may take our football, but they will never take our cricket. This adopts the celebratory tone of resistance, perhaps drawing on the speech from the popular film Braveheart. They may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. Now, on Test Match Special, the radio, the riots were virtually ignored with just the occasional unexplained reference, such as when another commentator referred to smoke from a burning warehouse. Another said, it's marvellous with all that's going on today that the match is going ahead, without explaining what all that's going on today was. Twitter, on the other hand, continued to have a lively stream of debate about each topic. Occasionally, arguments shaded into abuse, including in interactions directed at the TMS uh, commentary team. Now, some topics, however, spanned the radio and Twitter. At 2.35pm in a break in play, Geoffrey Boycott, a member of the commentating team, and many years ago one of England's top batsmen, claimed to remember hitting a six on this ground. That's hitting a ball right out, of the, out into the crowd. Agnew teasingly pretended to doubt him and asked the audience to email in if they could witness or corroborate this. Boycott pretends to be angry. They often have a, a kind of a sparring match invoking their, their wives, um, you know, when they're teasing one another. Um, and, but later, um, this is quite a bit later, um, Agnew reads out an email. Now, the joke here from Stephen in Ashburton, who says, definitely a top edge, I remember it well, is that the reference to a top edge suggests that rather than a skillful shot, it was a lucky one. Boycott again pretends to be furious, and the two continue to joke. Now, on Twitter, this topic is taken up too. Here's a tweet that very briefly manages to contain two jokes, at least. Boycott often compares cricket bats to sticks of rhubarb, so that's included here. But then there's a pun in the use of crumble, which refers to a traditional English dessert, rhubarb crumble, but is also used when a team collapses towards defeat. And just as with the jokes on the radio, you need a degree of understanding to appreciate all the levels of humour. Here, for example, Boix stands for boycott and walks for Warwickshire, a county cricket side. Now, to me, this is another nice example of how the brevity of Twitter can be used in witty ways. The journalist at the centre of my investigations, Jonathan Agnew, simultaneously engages with his various audiences, often orchestrating topics across both channels or keeping one for one and keeping it off another as appropriate. So on the radio, he doesn't refer to his Twitter interactions, not wishing to suggest that the audience might be missing out. He doesn't refer to the riots for other reasons to do with uh, policy. On Twitter, not least because of volume, many interactions uh, uh, aimed towards him are ignored. Um, sometimes he, he makes responses such as replies. If he's asked a question and kind of appreciates the question, often he'll retweet, simply retweet one, repeat one like this one, because he appreciates it. And it then gets retweeted many, many times. So this research did impress me enormously as to the amount of work, skill, and kind of moment-by-moment -moment decision making deployed across the radio and other communication channels such as Twitter. Um, I've taken this research into explorations of linguistic creativity online in everyday life and also into education. So finally, a vital question for us as educators, whether in schools, colleges, or universities, is the extent to which expertise in communicating across channels is a useful skill to have. It can help you get your message across, whether professional reasons or just for fun. And social media interactions, whatever the topic, can be unpredictable. And now here is Dr. Claire Hardacre to take us to the dark side. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to end on a cheerful note, I'm afraid. Um, very briefly, just to give you a background of what I researched so that you understand where I'm coming from. 
Um, my research is in deception, aggression, and manipulation. I'm particularly interested in how that occurs on the internet, and particularly in massive amounts of data. So as a quick example, um, you may have heard of the Ashley Madison data leak a little while ago. I'm very interested in that data set because apparently a range of the accounts in there were not real human beings. They were software operated. So I'm very interested in that kind of deception on a large scale. Uh, so that kind of makes me a forensic computer medi mediated corpus pragmatician or otherwise basically just a linguist. So uh, the things that I research kind of split into two rough areas. On the right hand to me, left hand to you, aggression, online abuse, cyberbullying, trolling, online harassment, cyberstalking, and on the other side, uh, all of the manipulation, deception. So that's things like, have we heard of catfishing? Uh, that's where you form a romantic relationship with a uh, sexy Susan who's 16 online and you really think you're in a relationship with sexy Susan and she is in fact Barry from Texas who's 50 or something. Uh, but you think it's real and it's a real relationship to you but the person does not exist. So it's a kind of emotional fraud rather than financial fraud. Uh, Munchausen by internet is a really distressing kind of emotional fraud where people will fake having a horrible illness or they'll fake a person that they know having a horrible illness and it sort of gains them attention attention, validation, sympathy, and so on. Uh, other things that I'm currently working on right now, serious organized crime, so grooming, radicalization, and trafficking. But what I focus on today uh, for the purposes of this talk is the stuff on the aggression side, particularly trolling. Okay, so trolls, uh, what are they? Well, it kind of depends on who you are as to what you think of a troll as. So in example A, at the sort of amusing end of the spectrum, there's a, a site by David Thorne. If you ever have a few spare hours and you want to go and read it, it's quite entertaining. He basically tried to pay a $233 bill with a picture of a spider. Um, and it, his whole uh, MO, his modus operandi, is to be annoying. And he just, he tried, it's a prank, it's a linguistic prank. And so um, the person responded and said, no, I'm sorry, you do in fact have to send a check with the money. Uh, and so then he emailed back and said, okay, well, can you send me my spider back again then, please? And the woman responded with, you want me to reattach it and send it back? And I've, yes, of course, you know, you can't keep it. Um, and so, and you'll note as well, the spider only has seven legs. And he offered to say, well, if I do you one with eight legs, will you accept that? Will that be good? And so on. You can now get sweaters with the seven-legged spider on. So it's, it's sort of become this thing. But at the other end, we have uh, Caroline Criado Perez, uh, who campaigned to have a woman on a British banknote back in 2013. Do you guys remember this? And she received rape threats, death threats, bomb threats. And it spiraled out from her to take in other high-profile women. Uh, so I think Colleen Nolan received one, a range of journalists, women journalists received them. And it would be threats like, there is a bomb in your house or under your car, it will detonate at 11 to 12 p.m. and everyone will die. And it was very difficult to determine, were these legitimate threats? Was this really going to happen? Were people really going to turn up? Uh, so she was basically targeted with really serious illegal abuse. Um, but the media is fairly indiscriminate in how it, in how it categorizes trolling. It's everything from, uh, the famous quote is, the least famous person in a disagreement is the troll. Uh, right through to full-on illegal behavior that can be prosecuted and you can, in fact, go to prison. So trolls, what are they? The jury is still out. The media pretty much calls all online abuse trolling, which is a bit unhelpful. Um, so why do people do this? One of my projects looked very particular. It was, in fact, the, um, the Caroline Criado Perez project where I looked at the abuse that she received and I looked at what triggers it and how do people make it okay? How did they justify their behavior? Because people don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna send vicious misogynistic abuse to a woman on the internet. They wake up and they, you know, everyone is the hero in their own uh, movie, if you like. So triggers that I found across the data, some of the classics that you'd expect, people just saying, I'm bored, I'm on my lunch break, I just want to kill some time. Um, people where, when you went back to check their account, there were quite clearly serious issues going on the, the evidence from the account was overwhelmingly that there were other issues going on that needed attention. Uh, we had a range of people who were young, immature, and inexperienced. So you could find people who were school kids who were sat together on the bus going home, egging each other on. Oh, you send this, I'll send this. And really causing each other to escalate through peer pressure and, and so on. And then uh, classically, one of the cases uh, was Isabel Sawley, who was prosecuted and sent to prison. Her defense was that she was drunk at the time, that she'd had a lot to drink, and she saw Criado Perez's name trending 
Uh, she went saw loads of people sending abuse and thought it was funny to join in and her defense was effectively that she drank too much so how do people make themselves okay with this how do they turn their behavior into something acceptable well i found some really interesting uh, themes that came out so people basically saying this is twitter this is what it's like if you don't like it leave twitter very much a victim blaming strategy actually that one uh, loads and loads of people who had no idea what free speech actually means. It's freedom, it's the internet, I can say what I like and you can't prosecute me. Again, now go speak to Isabel Sawley and John Nimmo who both went to prison. Uh, it's as in all countries where there is freedom of speech, there is almost always legislation that curtails that to an extent. So you can't incite people to kill others and so on. Very easy on the internet to become empathetically divorced. It stops being a human, and there's loads of psychology that shows this. If you're no longer looking at a human being a face, it's really easy to forget that there are feelings, because you don't have that real-time feedback, that emotional uh, expression on the face, tone of voice, and what have you. It's also easy if they write back and say, that really upset me, to just go, oh, stop exaggerating, grow up, that kind of thing, because you can just switch off that whole empathy side. Much easier to victim blame as well. And so you found loads of people saying, well, if she didn't want to get abused, she shouldn't have put herself out there then. She shouldn't have campaigned for this. Don't, don't put yourself in a public position if you don't want to have the public give you feedback. And if you don't like that, it's tough. Lots of offense diminishing. Oh, it was just kidding. This was just a joke. I, wasn't, I was obviously not really going to turn up at her doorstep and blow her house up, you know, but how would, how would she know this? And really interestingly, loads of people who were themselves the victim, you know, she's curtailing our rights. She's the bad guy. I'm campaigning. I'm the wronged person here. So I'll send her some rape threats and that will somehow, you know, I don't know. So loads of rationalizations, loads, and there's more, but this is all I can squeeze on a slide. Um, so, how does the internet facilitate, um, how does it cause that slippery slide? I'm not going to read every point here, but basically there's a psychological side and a technological side. On the psychological side, we know that one of the key factors is anonymity. Um, the fact that you are, you're given this cloak of invisibility, which is like a, it's like a shield and armor. People can't come and get you. You're not going to get punished. Uh, for your behavior, or that's the belief anyway. On the technological side, it's things like, particularly on Twitter, where Criado Perez's abuse exploded was when her name started to trend, and people would click out of interest and see the abuse and then jump in on board. Um, and so there's an interesting thing, particularly on Twitter again, uh, the snowflake avalanche thing relates to the fact that no snowflake feels responsible for the avalanche, which is the fact that one person would think, well, I'm sending this one tweet, and they didn't realize that she had in fact, started to receive this much in the way of abuse. So, very briefly, uh, what effectively happened was the Bank of England put a statement out on the 24th of July to say, we're taking her suggestion on board, we're going to put Jane Austen on a banknote. The next day, this, these are the number of tweets that her account received that you're looking at. It's a time series of abuse. And on the peak day, she received 8,000 tweets which if you, I mean, you literally cannot operate your account by that point because you, the stuff is coming in. By the time you've gone into your mentions, the, the screen is scrolling so fast you can't do anything. Uh, and each time something else happened, so when one of the individuals who sent her abuse was arrested, she'd get more abuse. And then when they went to court, she'd get, every time it hit the news, she would get more abuse until the point where she finally got fed up and where it flatlines here, she just switched her account off. She'd had enough and the abuse effective. There was no one to abuse at that point. So you get this mob effect, which is really interesting. So I want to end on quite, a, not that that was happy, but I want to end on a really serious note, which is um, you have individuals online who will troll each other. This person here is um, Brenda Leyland. And what happened in her case was that she was tweeting, uh, and she was tweeting about the Madeleine McCann, about the McCann uh, child disappearance. She was tweeting effectively a lot of the conspiracy theories that have followed the McCanns, which was that they were involved in the death of their daughter, that, that you know, somehow they were either irresponsible or that they actively murdered the child. And what happened was the media themselves, very quickly after the disappearance, all published very similar stories of this kind. But we go forward a few years, somebody hands in a dossier of tweets that this woman and others have sent, and the media basically used her front and center as a troll and said, look at this horrible troll who's putting out these stories that were effectively no different than the media themselves had put out. Two days after this international release on Sky News went out, uh, Brenda Leyland committed suicide. She hanged herself. 
And I went and actually collected her 2,020-something tweets and read through them all. And my personal perspective is she was not a troll. She had a theory. She thought the McCanns were responsible. She wasn't particularly nice sometimes, but she didn't go out there attacking people. She wasn't abusive. She didn't stir up trouble for its own sake. So this, for me, is why, when we go back to that first slide about what does it mean to be a troll, this is why I think this is important, because you label someone a troll, you put them as the face of trolling, and this is the kind of impact it can have on someone. So I think we have to be really careful that we don't just say, trolls, bad people, you know, let's do horrible things to them. It's got to be much more careful than that. And on that cheerful note, I hand to Stephen. <laughs>